This lecture will be on Southern Africa. So in Southern Africa, the types of environments that are there are sandy deserts, uh, some of the oldest deserts in the world around Namibia here, uh, cool forested highlands, uh, and that's what the green areas that you can see on this map in South Africa, and broad savannas. Um, so the people that originally occupied this area are a group of related peoples uh, called the San. And it's a little bit of a debate uh, amongst the peoples um, who are grouped under this banner of San, uh, whether that's what they like. <clears throat> Some would rather be called Bushmen, which is the name that was given to them um, by the uh, Bantu people that moved in uh, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and then continue to be used by the um, white colonists of South Africa. So some prefer that, uh, but some prefer San. Uh, so the Bantu ag agriculturalists who moved in, uh, they brought things like iron and pottery, and they built the Great Zimbabwe. Um, in the 17th century, the Dutch-speaking Afrikaners uh, came in, uh, and it's partly because Cape Town was um, part of the spice trade route between India and Europe. So that became a town in the 17th century. Uh, and then the Afrikaners put, took over the rest of what is now called South Africa in the 19th century. When I get to modern South Africa or modern, modern Southern Africa, I'm going to talk in more detail uh, about the um, actions of the Afrikaner colonists. So the rock art that is here in Southern Africa is some of the oldest rock art uh, in all of Africa. So the earliest known um, African art, about 25,000 BC. But if you know anything about uh, paleontology and anthropology, you know that humans evolved in Africa. So there's surely art that was done before this time. And I'll kind of explain some other reasons why we know this uh, a little bit later on but we just haven't found it. Uh, so art, it survives based on chance and it's somewhat serendipitous that it would come till today. So with this art though, we're looking at, uh, we don't have any writing around it and we don't necessarily have a modern people to be able to associate it with. So this is one of those things that when I do it in a real life class, I just ask the students, what are you seeing here? Uh, so if you wanna check out the extra credit board, maybe, um, get an idea on what you might be seeing here. Uh, painted forms, that is all that my source will get it. Uh, so your guess is as good as any of ours. So these ones are a little bit more precise and perhaps might have a relationship to more modern people. This particular one was found on the shoulder of a skeleton. Uh, so kind of placed and it fit very well uh, in that area. And they're similar stones that have been dated to about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and this one is from 2000 BC. So in it, you can see some things that we're going to see a little bit later on with the San people. There are three figures, and they seem to be archers. Uh, and they also have coloring and some details that resemble uh, the eland which is a type of antelope that lives in Southern Africa, which we'll talk about in more detail later. But as you can see, the figures are kind of unusual. They have these very uh, white faces. So these may be some sort of spiritual figures, uh, perhaps um, figures that transform into elands. Uh, I'll talk about later on why we think that might be the case based on the modern san. So it's an interesting kind of window into life in this area 4,000 years ago. So these ones in the Brandenburg Mountains uh, are kind of similar paintings that we saw, that we saw in Saharan rock art. Uh, so it's relatively naturalistic. Um, so we can see the elands here, and I'll show you a picture of one a little bit later on so you'll be able to understand what they look like. Uh, we can see some zebras, which are still fairly common in Southern Africa today. Then some human figures that are archers. But what we're going to concentrate on is this kind of mysterious figure right here. 
Vasona says designs on or near the figures may either depict physical adornment and material objects or a spiritual state. When we look at this figure close up, it's usually thought to be a feminine figure. It's not entirely clear uh, with the details that are here if that's the case. The figure is an archer and holding a particular type of very delicate uh, bow and arrow that the modern Song people use. But also all of these white details, they're very similar to what modern San do whenever they have certain ceremonies. So these pictures on the left were taken of modern San by um, a couple of tourists, they're not even scientists or anything. Uh, but you can see that the jewelry that they're wearing during a special occasion is made of ostrich shell beads. Uh, so ostrich uh, eggs are a very good source of nutrition. That's a whole lot of protein and they're relatively easy to get. So people that live in this area that are still hunter gatherers eat quite a few of them. But the shells themselves are extremely sturdy. Uh, so if you have some pretty good delicate tools, you can poke holes then in them and then run string through them and make these kinds of designs. So perhaps these uh, white dots represent something that's actually on the body or paint, uh, but perhaps they could also represent, and they really do, especially in the head of the figure, resemble these ostrich shell bead jewelry that modern song people have. So some of these pictures that we're looking at now are rather fascinating because it's a type of thing that everybody can do, uh, but is usually associated uh, with psychedelic drugs or something along that, those lines. So this is the Wunderwerk cave, uh, and some scholars believe these concentric lines form uh, in topic of Vasona's spelling in topic wrong here, uh, images, replicas of hallucinations experienced in trances or other altered mental states. Uh, so what in topic means is Sorry. Visual experiences derived from within the eye or brain as opposed to externally as in normal vision. So certainly people on psychedelics will see uh, entoptic images, ones created by their brain. But um, people in a normal state of mind uh, can also do that sort of thing. And I can give you an example. Uh, there was an art show that I saw at the mattress factory in Pittsburgh, which by the way, I highly recommend. And um, the show was kind of fascinating in that it was designed to bring up entoptic imagery. You would go upstairs into this one area uh, and they would only let a couple people in at a time. So usually um, whoever you're with and then maybe another person. And you would go up these stairs um, and there was a railing that was the side of you that you could hold on to because as you went down corridors and turned a corner, everything got darker and darker. And when you got finally to the end, uh, where there was a place for you to sit, it was complete and total darkness. Um, so all of the light had been filtered uh, out of the area. And the idea was to just sit. And when you do, at first, you don't see anything. It's completely dark. But over time, uh, some people, and I was one of them, will start to see and toptic imagery. Uh, so in my case, it was um, kind of like the Jimi Hendrix song, kind of like a, a purple haze um, and forms and shapes that were in that sort of shape. And that's a completely normal thing for the human brain to do uh, when it's presented with no visual input, uh, but your eyes are open. So that's what some of the ideas are on these stripes and lines. Uh, it may be that it's people who uh, and we'll talk about a ceremony that the San do that brings you into altered states. So it may be altered states that are intentionally created, or it could be, um, you know, states that just come about naturally when you're in very dark places. Sorry, tourist pictures are the best for it. Um, so they get uh, even stranger when we look at some of these pictures that are in the Matab Hills in Zimbabwe. These are before 1000 AD. So when you see the before thing, that means that uh, the painting had something that grew 
on top of it. And they were able to date whatever that substance was, usually some kind of like calcite or something. And they know that it grew after these paintings were done, so they know it's before that. The paintings could be literally 10,000 years before uh, that particular date. So all they can do is before. So when you look at these, you can see some of the animal figures like we saw in other paintings, uh, not just the ones in Southern Africa, but including ones that we saw in Northern Africa, but then also some interesting forms that may represent um, things that the peoples of this time used, uh, but they certainly have kind of a strange look to them. Perhaps these shapes refer to a type of aura, a spiritual force radiating from the wild animals or from the land itself. So v Vasona, I suspect, <laughs> grew up in the 60s and got a little creative with this part, um, but she's not the only scholar that thinks this way. And when I show you some of the ceremonies that the San do, you'll kind of understand why this might be, might be the case and why Vasona might be saying these things. Uh, but certainly like interesting kind of like abstracted images that are hard to interpret. Uh, and you can see the whole span of it here. Uh, we have more of those kind of like lines and patterns, uh, but also these interesting kind of floating imagery here as well. So this one, um, when you first look at it, uh, there's a lot going on. We seem to have like smaller figures uh, that are kind of abstracted. And then we have this very, very large fi figure also abstracted. Uh, but there are things that we can pick out that are pretty similar to things we know in real life. Um, this figure obviously is a male figure. Uh, you can see his penis and, uh, you know, supposedly like semen or something coming out of it. Um, and some of these figures seem to be hunters. Uh, so this imagery may seem kind of um, hard to interpret, but, um, and it is because we don't know exactly what they meant. Uh, but when we look at some of the practices, the modern son, we'll see, hmm, uh, and their beliefs. Uh, maybe this will make a little bit more sense. So when you get in close to this figure, you can see the head is very specific. So it seems like a human figure. It's shaped and marked like the head of a sable. So perhaps this was some kind of masquerade type of thing that the son people don't do anymore. Or perhaps like modern son, it's just an imagining of uh, transforming into an animal. So this is the sable. You can see the distinctive uh, white stripes coming down from the eye, going down to the snout, nose. I don't know. I'm not a biologist. Um, so quite a beautiful animal and also the, the horns here. Um, so modern San people kind of have those relationships with these things. So in Eastern Africa, uh, there's also some people who, like the San, are one of the few peoples left in Africa that are hunter-gatherers. Uh, and they have stone hair arrowheads dated to about 8,000 BC until the first century AD. The Hadza people, um, who are also our hunter-gatherers until the 20th century, uh, they paint similar images. Similar to what? Uh, your interpretation is as good as mine. This is another one where you might want to take to the extra credit board and see what's going on. Um, many other previous cl classes had a lot of ideas about it. Uh, <laughs> feel, be free, feel free to be creative as you wish uh, with this particular one. So in the Drakensberg Mountains, we see some images that are very closely related to the beliefs and practices of modern San. And, but modern San don't paint like this. Uh, so we're not absolutely certain that these are uh, made by San people. The San people themselves, though, believe that they're ancient. <clears throat> their ancient ancestors had made this. Uh, so establishing relationships, as Vasona says, between living peoples and ancient rock art is also problematic. And you notice there isn't a date on this because we're not sure. This date could be extremely old, uh, and it's really hard to tell, like 10,000 years old they could be. Um, so they're linked to the sun despite the possible extreme age, and we'll see exactly why that is. Um, the San people have, like a lot of other hunter-gatherer people, uh, suffered multiple waves. When the Bantu people came, uh, they were agriculturalists, uh, so they kicked the San people out of a lot of the good land. Uh, if you're a hunter-gatherer, if you have land that's good for farming, it's also good for hunting and gathering. Um, but throughout the world, agriculturalists have moved people to more extreme areas. Then when the Afrikaners um, took over this area, 
they tried, they attempted a genocide um, of the San people. They had bounties for for the San. They hunted them basically like animals uh, to try to eliminate them from everybody, from the entire land. Uh, so the San people were forced to go to some of the most extreme areas, uh, the deserts. Um, and people don't willingly live in deserts. Uh, so this was a way for them to protect themselves um, from the Afrikaners. So the modern uh, and the San peoples, they have different names for themselves. So one is Kung. Uh, the explanation point in the beginning is pronounced with a sound. Uh, I can't make the, the, the two together, but you can. I'll post a video that will show you how to make some of those sounds. Uh, they don't paint, but it's possibly similar lifestyles and beliefs. Uh, and there's really good reason to believe that, as we'll kind of see. Uh, so in this one, we have dancing figures, uh, and it seems to be some kind of masquerade. Uh, and Vasona uh, has some things to say about this one. Uh, she says, the figures appear to be circling the walls in a healing dance, just as Kung men and women dance today to cure an ailing person or to cleanse and rejuvenate a community. During these dances, spiritually gifted Kung feel a supernatural power called Na'am, and there's also a sound that I can't make all together, but it's like uh, boiling up within them. They may tremble, sweat, salivate, and collapse. And they need to be supported by the other dancers. In other song groups, the same type of altered state would trigger nosebleeds. Na'am is in the sweat of the affected Kung and can anoint a sick patient or the families who have gathered for the dance. The dancer at the left of the scene, uh, affect Connie Glenn, may be either a patient or a man in a trance while the figure bending over him could be shedding the um and his nasal blood in order to heal or soothe the falling figure. So this particular ritual, uh, how they prepare for it, is generally um, to stay up for days at a time and to not drink water. Um, so this combination of lack of sleep and dehydration uh, doesn't just cause the nosebleeds, but also causes the person that had done this um, to have hallucinations, to get into an altered state. Uh, so the San believe that this has healing power. So I'm going to post a video where you can see one of these ceremonies going on. The video is a bit on the old side, and the narrator makes a mistake uh, when identifying um, the medicine people of the San. He says in the video that only men can be um, the ones that can uh, dispense the Na'am medicine. Uh, but he's incorrect. Uh, both men and women amongst the San can be this, and any San can be it. So there aren't people amongst the San who are just medicine men or medicine women. Uh, anyone that's in the group that they're living in can be this at one time or another. Uh, so that's important to remember. Uh, because hunter-gatherer groups, they don't have uh, hierarchies like agricultural groups and, and like modern, modern groups like the one that we live in, <laughs> modern societies. Uh, they uh, lack hierarchy and they don't have permanent leaders and that's uh, consistent around the world. So the heads of the figures are enigmatic and seem to combine human and animal features. Spiritual system from a species of animal gives a gifted kung person the possibility to enter a trance state. And the animal-like heads depicted here could acknowledge the link between the human dancer and the source of his or her abilities to enter a trance. They may also literally depict humans wearing headdresses with feathers, horns, or animal ears attached. In some song groups, dancers once wore such caps to strengthen ties with the animal helpers, heightening their ability to harness Na'am. So part of this ceremony is related to the prey animals that... Um, and it's mostly men amongst the San that hunt. That's not the case with every, every hunter-gatherer culture. Uh, and the elands. Uh, so we have lots of elands pictured here. And I'm going to post another video that I'll tell you when to look at it because we're not quite, it's quite time for it. Uh, but it'll show how the San people do this. Uh, they use arrows that are very delicate. So the arrows don't kill them. Uh, they're poison-dipped arrows. Uh, so they die from poisoning. So for these highland hunters, the elan was associated with the sacred past, with sexuality and fertility, with spiritual transformation and power, and with joy and beauty. 
Um, so these prey animals becoming associated with life cycles of uh, people uh, and also the relationship between people in the wilderness and human beings and animals. So in this one, we have another interesting relationship between uh, a, perhaps a godlike figure. You can see these giant human figures here. Uh, then we have hunter figures, again, with these kind of like delicate uh, types of weapons. Um, so the painting shown here may have honored the godlike trickster and creator Kagan. Ching, one of the last of the Drakensberg San, told an interviewer that the eland was the animal beloved by Kagan. Uh, and Kagan has another one of those sounds I can't really make. When asked where Kagan is, he replied, we don't know, but the elands do. Have you hunted and heard his cry when the elands suddenly start and run to his call? Where he is, elands are in droves like cattle. Uh, so when we get kind of like closer into this picture, we can see that one of the elands is behaving in such a way uh, that is very similar to what happens to a medicine person when um, during the Naum ceremony. Uh, so Vasona continues, the lines flowing from the nostrils of the eland and the tiny flying human figures scampering above and around them can be linked to sonic experiences of trance states. When an eland is mortally wounded by a poison arrow, the hair in his neck will rise and it will stumble, as some have seen clearly in this painting. Some of the dying eland in the scene are bleeding from the nose, trembling and gasping for breath. Some of our physical symptoms are experienced by the dancers filled with Na'um. Kung dancers say that this trance state is like floating or swimming underwater or like the death of the eland itself. The painting may thus refer to a type of spiritual ecstasy joining dancers to sacrificial elands. Uh, so when somebody does something um, like uh, dehydrates themselves and goes without sleep, uh, they can bring themselves into this trance state again, uh, and they can bring themselves to a feeling of what it's like for people to die in a very particular way. Uh, I wouldn't wish this on any of you, uh, but um, I had had an experience where I lost a lot of blood to the point of, of passing out, and um, it's obviously very scary at first, uh, but before you pass out, um, it isn't scary at all. Uh, it's this kind of like freeing feeling that you have. Um, so the Elands who are giving up their lives and they're going through what seems the same thing that happens when during the Nam ceremony, when somebody is injured and they're dying um, from blood loss. And that loss of life uh, leads to the Elands being able to make life. Um, so seeing this kind of sacrifice uh, as both a gift from the God uh, and also something that they relate to um, and this kind of cycle of life uh, idea um, comes up in this art. So this is part of the reason why we think, despite the, the song not painting today, that these artworks are related to people with similar beliefs. So this one we can see very clearly a, uh, maybe a human-like figure or a god-like figure, certainly one standing on two legs, with Elan-type um, coloring, uh, also with the hair standing up uh, like happens to the elan before they collapse. Uh, so the last video I want you to see, I'll post it up, is very interesting. So uh, watch the video now and kind of pause it. And then I'll tell you what I think about the video afterwards. So pause it now, watch the video. So now that you've seen the video, uh, and it's the last video of market as, as the one that has to do with uh, language uh, and the San people. In the video, they talk about a lot of interesting things. The first things are genetics. Uh, they talk about how the San peoples uh, broke off from the branch of the rest of humanity uh, before anybody else. But the modern San can do everything that every other human on earth can do. Uh, and part of the reason why is because humans, unlike other mammal species, are very, have very little genetic diversity. Uh, but as the narrator mentioned in the video, uh, the modern San have far more uh, genetic diversity. So those two lines of evidence tell us that they're, as they said in the video, just a little bit of 
not the right way of understanding it, but the oldest people, uh, just meaning the people that separated from the rest of humanity. But again, they have all the same abilities as everyone else. And in the video, they talk about some things that have to do with a theory of language. Uh, so some of you may know uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, as most people nowadays know him um, as, uh, for his political views and such, uh, but how he became famous uh, in his most important work as a scientist was as a linguist. And he had come up with theories that uh, were to explain uh, how language developed in human beings. The belief at that time, coming from B.F. Skinner, is that you learn through behavior. Um, so uh, you're basically constantly told what's right and what's wrong uh, by the adults around you when you're young. And then from that, you learn how to, to speak. But uh, Chomsky and then later others mentioned that there's what Chomsky called a poverty of stimulus. There isn't enough of humans uh, getting told what's the wrong thing to do and what's the right thing to do for everybody to be able to develop language so easily. So he um, postulated based on this that um, language had developed uh, relatively suddenly um, more than 50,000 years ago. And we know it's that because the song, song can speak exactly the same as everybody else. And what this language did, and he said this isn't a majority view, uh, but rather than being um, functional for communication, um, which Human language, if you look at it compared to, say, like computer languages, which were developed based on Chomsky's ideas a lot of times, uh, the human language isn't very effective as a communicator. Uh, everybody speaks it, um, a language uh, that they learn. So, you know, eventually you learn to communicate. Uh, but he, uh, Chomsky, speculated that it was to map thought. Uh, so in the video, they talk about how between 50,000 and 100,000 years ago, uh, that human beings started to m develop um, more complicated tools. Uh, they started to have uh, more decorations on their bodies uh, when we found them in graves. Uh, and they started to make art. Uh, so Homo sapiens, uh, the origin of it goes back to recent research shows 300,000 years. Uh, but for the first uh, 200 to 250,000 years of that time span, uh, humans didn't seem to behave uh, particularly differently than the species that came before them. So uh, something happened between 50 and 100,000 years ago that gave human beings, uh, according to Chomsky, uh, language, our, our very complex language, uh, and the ability to kind of look forward in seemingly endless multiple steps. Uh, so um, nowadays, uh, the... Uh, linguists um, are kind of in a battle between different sides, but what Chomsky believes is the one thing that human language has that's different than other types of languages is, is recursion. We can develop um, ideas within ideas within with ideas endlessly, and every human being on earth can do this without having to be taught. And if you think of language as a mapping of thought, then it's the things that allow us to do what we can do. And you can see it in the video. The San people are looking far ahead. They're developing tools where they have many steps that exist between um, the time, for instance, that they carve, figure out that bone is a very good material to use for their arrows, uh, to be able to use the poison, um, to develop the techniques, uh, to be able to use the arrows, uh, to track them over time. All of these things require thinking um, far into the future, ideas within ideas within ideas within ideas. Uh, so this is a profound um, change in human beings that we can see reflected uh, in the San. Uh, it's changed human beings from an animal that was pretty smart uh, compared to other animals, but um, became an animal that was uh, endlessly creative. Uh, so we can just look around us and see uh, all that humans have created, uh, and there's no animal on Earth that is even remotely compares to this level of creation. Uh, the other thing that we can get that human beings all around the world, uh, despite having extremely different cultures, uh, we do have some commonalities, and that commonality is that we're all... 
uh, born with the ability to create, uh, to look forward, to say and do things that have never been done before. Uh, and all of those things put together make human beings rather unique. So check out that video um, about language in the San. And if you have other comments about it, because there's a lot of other interesting ideas in there, um, let me know.